Good day, Clark. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thank you so much for having me. For our audience, could you start off and, uh, and share with us your name and give us a little bit of background and, and tell us where you grew up? Sure. Uh, my name is Clark Aldrich, uh, and I've done a tremendous amount of different learning kinds of experiences, which we can talk about it or, or not or skip right over. Uh, but I grew up in Concord, Massachusetts. Oh, thank you. And uh, where, where did you go off to school and what did you study? I went to Brown University uh, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and I studied cognitive science, which is sort of how the brain learns. And I took a special interest in the artificial intelligence part of cognitive science. So my degree would be thought of as an AI degree today uh, and sort of a pure AI, not a machine recognition AI as sort of a lot of them are today. Uh, so I worked in a lot of parallel distributed processing and neural matrices and modeling the brain in all, all different kinds of ways. So it was, it was a lot of fun, very intense. Uh, and actually very helpful for what I eventually ended up with. So can you share with us uh, where do you live and uh, what do you do now? I live about uh, 20 miles east of Yale University uh, in Connecticut, and I run a company called Short Sims, uh, which is a, a company around developing a, a new kind of educational simulation for clients. Then I also do a lot of sort of consulting work around broader educational technology issues. Um, and I get to work with a, a huge variety of clients from military, and I, I used to have a top secret clearance uh, not too long ago, uh, to nonprofits, to, uh, to small startups, schools and new school models, to uh, big corporations, to government entities. So uh, part of the, the appeal, part of what I wanted to do is work with a, a variety of clients. Uh, and again, the focus is, is around short sims and educational simulations, but it's a, it ends up being a lot broader than that. Thank you for that. So let's back up a little bit to uh, and, and kind of cover your job progression. Where have you been and what have you been doing and any interesting projects you've done along the way? But where did you go after leaving Brown? Um, my first real job uh, was with Xerox. And at Xerox, I was the speechwriter for the number two person there, the person in charge of sales and marketing. So it was a, a really fun jump from you know flipping bits and, and teaching myself assembler uh, in a computer language to uh, traveling all over the world and in, in, a, in a corporate jet, uh, preparing speeches. Uh, and funnily enough, that got me involved in some of the stuff we'll be talking about today, which is around you know human improvement. Xerox had won recently, not that recently, but the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And at the time, uh, Xerox and my boss specifically was getting involved in the European National Quality Award, sort of the equivalent of the Malcolm Baldrige Award. So I ended up writing a tremendous amount of speeches uh, around quality and the quality methodology at Xerox and everything from Six Sigma to A Delta T. Uh, and my, my boss uh, shared a lot of jet rides. And so I got to basically ride in the trunk uh, with someone like, like Jack um, Walsh from, from GE. And so there's a lot of conversations that I could be a fly in the wall on regarding quality and quality processes and, and, and that whole area. So it was a really nice exposure to, to that. Um, I left Xerox and went to Gartner uh, that then called Gartner Group, rebranded as Gartner, uh, and I and I actually founded their e-learning coverage. So I was there right at the time when there was some interest in e-learning, uh, some very very early initial interest in e-learning, and so I. I raised my hand and sort of launched and started and launched their e-learning coverage. And so I got to work with a lot of corporations in terms of developing uh, their e-learning processes, everything from virtual classrooms to standalone content to sort of learning management systems, all these sort of early things that were just being tested out. And, you know, people would literally call and say, I, I want to do e-learning. Should I do a learning management system or should I do a virtual classroom? You know, it's like, well, let, let's back up just, just ever so slightly here. Uh, and then I went from there and, and my big problem there was, was the quality of content. And I'm, I'm a content geek. I really, really like good educational content. Uh, and the problem back then, and frankly, hasn't gotten much better today, is the nature of educational content was everyone, the, the generation before me, uh, the, the baby boomers, I'll, you know, I'll say, were really, really excited that they were able to move content online and they created sort of basically online workbooks. And they were so proud of their online workbooks. It's like, hey, we can do an online workbook. It's a workbook, but it's online. Um, and I think people like me, sort of the, the next generation down, the Gen Xers who grew up on computer games, were like, yeah, it's okay, uh, but, but can't we do better? And so I've spent, you know, since leaving Gartner, I've spent a very long time 
working with a lot of leading organizations, again, everything from the, the, the Gates Foundation to, um, to, you know, to the NSA, um, to, to big corporations, trying to, you know, A, develop educational simulations that met my standards for what a, you know, what a good educational simulation should be, but then ultimately moving away from the big game-like model to the much more nimble approach. And the approach that the company right now uh, is named after short sims, which is like, how do we create content that takes the same amount of time as workbook style content, but it's actually good and people actually like to take it. Uh, and it's very action focused, but it's still simple and direct and straightforward. So it, it has all the advantages of workbook style content from a predictability perspective, but also all the advantages of a more interactive learning to do experience. Um, so long story. Yeah, no, thank you so much for all of it. That's very, very interesting. So the, the difference between workbooks and simulations or short simulations is, is what? It's just the application of, of the content to something specific or authentic or how can you define Sims and short Sims for us? Sure. So I think workbooks are basically learning to know experiences. You read a workbook, you consume it passively, you hit next, next, next a lot. Um, you know, there are things like bullets, you know, and, and I don't think anyone outside of the workbook space and PowerPoint space thinks, you know, thinks of content in terms of, you know, bullets. Here are seven things to think about when you're dealing with customers. And it's like, yeah, that doesn't work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very passive uh, way of, of presenting content and structuring content. Simulation-based content is much more, how do we give learners a series of interesting decisions? Uh, and so it's, it's a, you know, a Sid Meier who came up with the civilization games amongst other things said a computer game is basically a series of interesting decisions. And it's taking that philosophy to education and saying, well, you know, that's what learning is too. How do we make a bunch of interesting decisions? Uh, and so, you know, a good short sim might present, might be 10 minutes long and present someone with probably seven, no, well, yeah, probably about five decisions a minute. So by the time you're done playing a short sim, you've made a, you know, probably you know, 30 or 40 or whatever number of decisions of which half of them are pretty impactful. Uh, and so it's a great way of learning. It's very active. Uh, it's, it's very, um, it's action focused. It's what do you do, not here's 10 things to remember. And so it's also about the application of content. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, I mean, I really can't overstress First of all, how much of education is based on a passive model? Uh, because for 400 years or whatever, we've grown up with books uh, and lectures and writing papers, all this non-interactive stuff. And so we have all this pedagogy um, that I think is disposable, that frankly, we could walk away from tomorrow and not, and not lose a lot. We're just starting to have a new pedagogy, an entirely new way of thinking about presenting content uh, around actions and how do we make the learners active in the process and not, you know, like line up this column with that column or this sort of this, you know, typical workbook style stuff, but, you know, but real, you know, here's a situation, what do you do? Uh, here's, here's, you know, now here's a situation, what do you do? Uh, and I think that is, I think we're going to learn that that is really how people learn. Uh, and I think it really does change behavior in a way that um, I think workbook style content does not. For some of the in the audience, um, how is this similar or different from action learning? How are you defining action learning? Well, it's the well, a lot of action learning is taking a real work problem and having a group actually work through it. So I guess it has, you know, that's the definition I learned back in the 80s of action learning and, and how to do that. But it seems that but you're and you're making a bunch of decisions. You're just working on a real world problem, which then people can get all caught up. I think in in solving that real world problem, not necessarily doing the the learning, the reflecting on what they're doing, and and uh, uh, actually having takeaways from that that they can generalize to other situations. Yeah, so I think they're very. Parallel. Like I think your 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 simulations then are seem that they have the promise to be working on things that are authentic to people's performance. And that's why I wanted to talk to you and interview you is because my, my take from what I've seen is that this is very applicable and authentic to what people need to do back on the job. And you're just putting them through something that's less passive, that's much more active where they actually have to do something through the whole thing. Is that a good read or have I got that wrong? No, you're absolutely right. I'm so I mean, action learning is great. Action learning is a wonderful way of, of, of applying content, of digesting it, 
I think sometimes the lessons learned aren't really quite obvious, as you say, which is fine. Um, I think it's great for, for getting group to, to bond together. I think it's a great, great exercise for actually making something better. Um, I think, the, as you say, it's not really good for new employees. It's not even really, you know, high potential employees can't always do that. I mean, the big problem with action learning is it's not very convenient. Um, it's expensive uh, to do. The, the learning isn't necessarily clear. In this day and age, and action learning came about when people could take two weeks and do, do training for two weeks or three weeks. Um, and, you know, I mean, an hour is a new week of training. We don't have that kind of time. It's very hard to say, hey, uh, you know, you're a high potential person. Why don't you leave your job for two weeks and do this training opportunity? And the boss is going to go, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, and everyone else can say, no, we can't afford that. And so, again, I think that the, the action learning was a great model for you know, in, in 1993, perhaps. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a practical or affordable today, uh, because these people are, are, are just so busy. Um, it's also requires almost necessarily, this may be a wrong statement, but you know, people to be co-located, which again, happens less and less these days. Sometimes, you know, you can do action learning uh, remotely, but I think it does, you know, you do miss some of the, of the grist. So, it's some of the same philosophy of, of you know, you learn when you do. Um, short sims are much more predictable, much more structured, uh, much more self-paced, um, you know, hopefully even more engaging. Part of the thinking that went into short sims from my perspective is I built a very, very complicated uh, educational simulation called Virtual Leader, which had, you know, 50,000 lines of AI code. It was a, a you know, really great AI engine. Um, and it was very powerful to teach leadership skills to people. Um, and it was fun to, to develop it and roll it out and, and, and measure the heck out of it. But when you actually did the analysis, um, despite all the real-time 3D rendered graphics and all that stuff, it basically came down to about six different techniques. You know, do you collaborate or, or are you directive? Do you boss people around or do you or do you listen to them? You know, if you're the only one talking at a meeting, is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? Um, and so... I could sort of get the lessons learned of this incredibly complicated real-time 3D animated blah, 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 uh, you know, in a short sim today and, and basically have the same, same lessons learned, but in a quicker and more focused way. And so it's, you know, it's different from action learning, even though there's some of the same, uh, some of the same uh, threads that go through it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, my two questions come to mind. How short is a short sim or what's the range? And, and two, is this done by somebody going doing this solo or are they in a group or could it be both or how does that work? Sure, so I recommend anyone who cares about this topic, uh, go to shortsims.com forward slash examples. And so, you know, we all talk the same game in the, in the, in the training and development space. We all talk about this stuff. It's, you know, be really, really suspicious whenever you're talking to a vendor who's not putting their content on their front page of saying, this is what I'm talking about. So, um, so I put all my content, or I put a lot of content out there so people can see how it looks and feels and you very quickly go, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's not as complicated as I thought. It's more simple, but it also seems to be more effective than that. Um, so to answer your question now, uh, about 10 minutes is sort of the average short sim. Um, and what was your second question? Well, it was, do people do this on their own? Uh, Thank you. Self -pa yes. self -pace, so that's kind of suggests that it's not necessarily a, a team activity or a small group activity. That is correct. And so for a bunch of reasons, including um, a lot of organizations that trouble or, you know, again, once you start having multiplayer situations and you have a layer of collaboration that is required just to do it, you have coordinating and, oh, my partner didn't do you know, his work or her work uh, or whatever. And so um, my almost my goal was to get rid of every excuse possible. You know, let's get rid of the cost excuse. These are not more expensive than workbooks. Let's get rid of the time. Let's get rid of the multiplayer components of it. Let's get rid of the, let's get rid of the unpredictability of it. Let's get rid of the, let's get rid of all of these excuses because we're so good at coming up with excuses why we don't do anything. Uh, let's get rid of every single excuse we possibly can. And now we have a solution in short sims. Um, it's, again, it's not proprietary. So it's not like, oh, Clark is just pitching his proprietary. No, no, this stuff is not, this stuff in my mind is a sort of a new approach to content that's, you know, should become a dominant replacement for passive content in both corporations and schools, you know, within mumble number of years, hard to predict. But so again, this is not like, oh, this is this, this weird proprietary technology. Um, 
So, you, but you take away all these excuses that we have, including multiplayer being an excuse, you know, unpredictability. Oh, I, you know, I did a good job in my half of the multiplayer, but my friend was screwing around. No, uh, you know, so it's a 100% predictable in terms of, in terms of delivery and easy to do in terms of delivery, which is really important. Well, thank you. Uh, and I will put the uh, URL that you uh, mentioned in the show notes of this video so that people can uh, follow up and uh, take a look at that. But I just thought there's some things that this could be easily confused with because we are so sloppy with our language in this profession uh, that I didn't want people to uh, misunderstand what this was. And I, I would like to point them to this so that they can follow up themselves. Yeah, and I think the other part to see there is a short sim really is how people really do learn. I mean, how do you learn? You, you learn by, you you know, you try to open the door and it doesn't work. So you push a little harder or you turn the knob the other way or something. We are constantly, you know, you, you go to a meeting and you present, but then you look back and go, oh man, I can't believe I screwed up. Or someone afterwards says, hey, Clark, you, you really, you talk too fast or you, you know, you didn't understand the audience or whatever. You know, it's how we learn in the real world is by making a series of mistakes. And so, you know, the, the real goal and, and this, is, this gets back to almost the methodology that I use for subject matter expert interviews. The primary question that I ask subject matter expert interviews when I'm doing a short sim interview is, what are common mistakes? What are mistakes that newbies make? What are mistakes that, 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 inexperienced, that experienced people make? And if you start by asking that question and then work backwards from there, or not, not, not even that far, um, then you start understanding, you know, what are all the mistakes people make in, you know, interpersonal leadership in a sales call? What are all the mistakes that people make in, um, you know, in, in creating a team around, around uh, creative individuals? What are all the mistakes that people make around thinking about diversity and inclusiveness in the workplace? Um, you know, you, you, you start, you work backwards from there, and then suddenly you actually have content that's highly relevant and it's based on the real world. It's how we really think. So if you do go to the, the short sims page, You'll, I think you'll make two observations. And one observation is, oh, you know, these aren't that complicated. I understand these. And you also go, these seem really, really natural. These, you know, as I look at these, these kind of feel like the way that a, a normal person learns. You know, we don't learn by bullet points. We don't learn by con learning how to conjugate the verb. You know, we, we learn, we learn uh, by, by speaking. And so it's it, the, the effortlessness of it, the effortlessness of learning this way is utterly different than learning through a workbook style, which is a, a pretty miserable task. So oh, true. All right. Well, let me shift gears a little bit here. My, the name of this series is uh, HPT Videos, Human Performance Technology, also known by many, many, many other labels. But it's all about evidence-based practices for performance improvement. So, uh, and I think that the, your short sims are, are right up that alley as, as you've described them here in this video. But so are you familiar with this notion of human performance technology by that name or by some other name? And can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to it? Well, that gets back to the Xerox experience with, with all of the quality work there, which is in very, very focused on some of the earliest efforts in that area. So, um, so I think I'm very, very familiar with the, the, the state of the technology at that time, which I think has obviously evolved since then. But A Delta T and Six Sigma and all those things were, were, were what I was, was living and breathing for a while and helping companies uh, think about. Um, having said that, I want to add, a, a because um, I don't want to lose my reputation as being curmudgeonly, um, I'm going to... I've encountered evidence-based as a prefix to a lot of things. And I think evidence-based blankety blank is becoming a bit of a, a real problem right now. And I, I think it's a terrible, terrible phrase, um, evidence-based anything. I don't go and get an evidence-based pizza. I don't go to an evidence-based movie. Um, if I was hiring an architect and this architect said, hire me, I'm an evidence-based architect. You'd say, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, you mean the building's not going to blow up? Well, you know, I'm going to assume that. So I, I, I actually think it's a term that sounds good. And, and I've worked with a lot of organizations that have thrown that in as sort of like the bat phone and the bat car and the evidence-based, you know, assessment and the evidence-based whatever. And, and maybe I'm, I'm extra super duper cynical for a bunch of reasons, including you know, it tends to be based on the flawed workbook model and how do we, you know, how do we perfume this pig? But it's, I, I, I think it's, you know, we all want different things from content. We all have an incredibly hard time measuring stuff. Uh, and to some degree, it's kind of like saying, you know, 
20 years ago going to the store and saying, Hey, you want to buy some organic granola or organic shredded wheat or organic, whatever. And you know, in other words, it's going to taste terrible. In other words, you're going to hate it. You know, it's going to taste like straw, but it's good for you. And so I, I almost think we're, we're maybe unaware from a, from a end user perspective, from our sponsor per perspective of saying this stuff doesn't look like it's going to work. This stuff doesn't seem like it's going to work. This stuff is really expensive. Um, but trust me, it works. And if you don't, you know, and, and by, by the way, I'm smarter than you are because I'm a, I'm a professional here. I'm an evidence-based professional. Uh, and so if you don't like it, um, then that's because you're wrong and, and I'm right. And so I, I, I'm really, really concerned with it as, as potentially a not as helpful as we think it is. And it may even undermine uh, the, the conversations with, with, with sponsors and the conversations with, with even end users. As an old gray beard here, uh, you know, that, that phrase came about, I'm, I'm not sure exactly when it displaced what, what the phrase used to be research-based. Um, and so I think there's, there, you know, there's a lot of problems with, with the labels that we use and it's sometimes our jargon and we shouldn't, you know, we should speak in the language of the clients instead of our own jargon. But so how do you refer to this notion or whatever construct of we're trying to improve human performance in the workplace, the workflow, what, you know, lots, again, lots of buzzwords and language and all that stuff, but if we're trying to improve people's ability to perform in their jobs, What's your label for that? How, what, 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 how do you speak about all of that? I don't have a good label. And so I think human performance technology is as good as any, um, but it certainly doesn't roll off the tongue and it certainly doesn't, you know, I, I, I have not seen a situation where you have the CEO of, of GE saying, hey, how much, you know, can we have six gallons of human performance technology, please, or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think organizations have strategic goals and they say, oh, you know, we need to shift from selling software to selling cloud services. We need to, um, we need to upskill our people in ransomware protection. You know, we need to blah, blah, blah. And so organizations have strategic goals and they're, you know, they're short term generally. And, and, you know, you're either successful or you're not, but regardless of which you move on to the next one. And so, you know, I don't care what it's called, but my problem right now is, you know, people are working at remotely and we're seeing all kinds of microaggression in the, in the chat rooms. And we're seeing, you know, how can we, you know, deal with the microaggressions or we're seeing, you know, salespeople who don't know, who don't understand where the market is going, or, or we have a you know, manufacturing process where we're our products per million are, you know, are way too high compared to our competitors. First, we need to benchmark and then we need to, we need to figure out our processes for, for fixing those things. And so I think, you know, the higher up you go in the organization, the more, um, the more they're focusing on sort of their their goals, not your terms. And, you know, again, whether it's in Yellow Pages is under, you know, human performance technology or not. One more quick thought here, and this may or may not be a, a useful thought, but I, I'm struck by it. So I work a lot with, mil with military cultures as well as with, with corporate cultures. And I love the way military people speak. And again, I went to an Ivy League school. I sort of think in a sort of an Ivy League kind of framework. Um, I try tend to, or my old bad habits were using multisyllabic sort of complicated, interesting words um, that had great cultural literacy associated with them, or, you know, a subtle nuance to Hofstadter or aren't they clever? Ha ha ha. Um, but people in the military speak very, very bluntly and very in a nice, in nice, big, simple terms. You know, I don't have a dog in that fight. You know, you're, it, it went through the process like a pig through a python. And I think the more kind of wonky intellectual you are, the more you look down on that way of speaking initially and it's a horrible habit but it's there that a lot of people have on looking down at this at that kind of big visual metaphor speaking but the longer you're around it the more you understand how absolutely powerful it is and then once again i i i, I go back and forth between cultures and one thing i noticed as well is that the higher up you are in an organization i.e the cxo level they start speaking that way too and so the ceo of an organization is going to speak in big visual metaphors because he or she has to communicate you know big ideas in a way to minimize interpretation their goal is not to show you how smart they are their goal is to is to communicate i need everyone to do blank you know and then this you know this this dock's on fire you know this this we don't want to burn the bridge whatever it is and they do speak in very very big visual metaphors and so I, I worry about anything that sounds a little, for lack of a better word, middle management-y. Uh, sounds like the, you know, the upper middle management who sort of thinks in these very kind of intellectual terms. 
uh, in a way that becomes harder and harder to communicate with, with anyone else. So that would be my caveat around the term, which is we don't want to continue to cul-de-sac ourselves you know, by not thinking in terms of, you know, big visual metaphors. And that's why I like short sims is, you know, it's a big, it's a, you know, it's self-explanatory. It's a short, it's a sim. Okay. Any questions? Great. Move on. Um, you know, it's not super wonky. It's not super propeller heady. Um, and once people hear it, they understand it very quickly. And once they see a couple of examples of it, they get it. They may or may not want to do it. They may or may not like it. They may or may not, whatever. It may not solve any of their problems, but, you know, they understand it. And I do have to think we have to think a little more in terms of CXO and or military people and how they talk about things rather than aren't we smart and clever for our, our, our fancy terms. Yeah. I think that I've had a lot of guests say that, uh, you know, they may have a name for it, but they never use it uh, in client situations, but uh, you know, it's helpful to talk to their peers sometimes, but I think that's, that's one of the takeaways here is that we can get enamored with our own labels and think, you know, how, see how smart we are. We're using these, uh, uh, clever labels or uh, names for things, and it doesn't necessarily uh, help communications. But so thank you for that. So let me shift gears a little bit. So can you share with us as a way to point others perhaps to people or articles or books that were highly influential to you when you started, not at this stage of your career, but back back early on, what were some of the things that you found that, that helped you uh, have a better understanding, uh, have a different perspective that that uh, has has helped you in your career. I really like uh, reading interviews and actually doing some interviews with with computer game designers. Uh, I have found in you know when I was starting off, I was much more interested in you know computer game like Deus Ex or something of, or what people were doing in the computer game space than people doing, frankly, in the training space. Uh, I also liked the movie space and how do people talk about movies and so you know that comes up a lot in, in short, certainly short sims but the notion of the story beat for example and so that you know the if you're talking to a, a showrunner or you're talking to a, a script doctor or something you know they're gonna talk about story beats and story arcs um those are really really useful concepts for us um you know if you're obviously talking about computer games it's feedback loops and and whatever and these are all much more interesting terms to me than what sort of the industry bandies about uh as sort of the the flavor du jour and so it's it's um so i, I find them frankly the more mature uh industries and uh the more that are aligned with where i think again where's the puck going not not where the puck is you know where do you imagine training going and then how do you you know what industries are, are that like uh and then how do you get there rather than you know get sucked up in the current debate du jour Mm-hmm. Get, but is there anything specific that you might identify that where people could learn about story beats or the story arc? As you said? Um, again, I think movie podcasts. Um, I think there's a lot of great yeah. podcasts right now uh, discussing. Um, you know, even you know, this is a dated reference, and I apologize, but uh, you know, like Game of Thrones, there's a lot of podcasts sort of dissecting all the plot beats and all the stories and characters in, in, in Game of Thrones, and that I find that more useful than the newest guide on instructional design in terms of you know how do we we create things. Um, you know, I uh, even um, James L. Brooks, who wrote uh, Broadcast News uh, and the Mary Tyler Moore Show and and, and a few other uh, works. Um, you know, how succinctly can you say something? One of the great problems, I mean, the, the, one of the, the things I do with short sims is, is cut out words and say, how few words can you use? Uh, you know, oh, you have 20 words. How about 10 words? How about seven words? How absolutely, you know, we can't overwrite uh, in this. We can't overwrite uh, when we do all the time. Uh, how you know, people hate reading or, you know, people hate reading on computer screens. Um, and so how do we not, you know, get go down this trap of, of hear all these words and, and, and be incredibly precise. So how do we get inspired to write less? How do we get, you know, inspired to have, you know, for every, every, every story beat, every moment, every decision in a short sim, I want, you know, two sentences to set it up. And if I have three that I'm, I'm really unhappy. And so how do you just keep it moving along quickly as opposed to, Hey, read three paragraphs and then make a decision. No, I want you to read two sentences and then, you know, choose from three, really interesting options and that's going to you know that's what's going to keep you moving rather than you know start you know start bookmarking this thing because it's going to take a while thank you it i still it, haven't answered your question and i apologize well, but no but no you did you did as uh, uh, give us a name there and perhaps we'll follow up with that but let me let me say one more thing if i if i sure. may which is um 
So again, I work with, with some other organizations other than traditional ones. And one organization I work with is called Acton Academy out of Austin, Texas. And they're a sort of a Montessori style school who's focused almost exclusively on, on challenge-based learning, where we say, we're going to give kids, um, rather than giving them lectures, rather than giving them workbooks, rather than giving them you know all that stuff, our entire curriculum is going to be based around a series of quests and challenges. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, put people into those situations. We're going to give them challenges. We're going to force them to be creative, to work together as a team um, and, and continually practice this and develop skills and passions and interests based on, on a, on, you know, projects that could easily be eight weeks long. These are not like, you know, the afternoon and then have some Kool-Aid. It's, this is long, you know, these are big, meaty complicated projects that they're working on and you know what what are what are future energy sources and what are what um and so again i i so you know if you go to acton academy's uh website um and you just just poke around and you just hear all of this kind of language which i think has been stripped away from a traditional academic culture and therefore out of a t- traditional training culture because they're, they're based on one of the same um and here's this whole new breath of fresh air in terms of you know how do we really fundamentally rethink what it is to to learn and have truly student-centric content i wrote a book called unschooling rules which was my fifth book which was a, a major deconstruction of all of schools. I'm just saying, you know, you know everything we're doing is wrong, basically. Um, when, when, you know, the way we've evolved schools is just really, really not, not so good. Uh, you know, the leadership style is a directive leadership style, which means I'm the smart one, you're the dumb one, I'm going to tell you what to do, uh, versus a collaborative leadership style, which is, let, you know, let's work together to, to figure out a problem that you're interested in, not a problem that I, that I want you to be interested in. So, you know, and, and, it's, a, and, and it's a short book on this whole topic. And they, they, Act in Academy embraced unschooling rules and sort of made it mandatory reading for all their new parents just to freak them out. <laughs> you know, and say, you know, you're either going to be really freaked out by this book or not. If you're not freaked out by this book, then let's talk. If you are freaked out by this book, then thanks so much. Have a have a good life, kind of thing. Um, so again, I, I think we once again we got to move away from this 400 years of of legacy that we're stuck with and and start start through really fresh eyes. Hmm. Well, again, I'll uh, I'll get at the URL for your that book and your other books and include those in the show notes so that we can point people to that. So let me shift gears here again uh, as so as as a way of to give an example to others that they can uh, uh, steal from uh, the best of it. Uh, if you were to give us a thirty second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Um, I create short sims, which are 10 minute long interactive experiences that uh, put users in fairly realistic situations that are abstracted uh, in order for them to make all the common mistakes that people make in the real world, but do it in a faster, cheaper, more efficient way and give them fast feedback. And so it's a very quick way of getting people comfortable with, with a topic. Thank you for that. Again, uh, shifting gears a bit. As a lifelong learner, uh, what's your current focus or your next phone focus for your own learning? And uh, are you are you writing anything about this that uh, uh, that people can go look for or uh, can, might soon find? So Short Sims has been about a five year research effort on my part, or maybe six years. So it's been a, a really major last chunk of my life that came off of being focused on more complicated simulations. So about about six years ago, I decided that simpler was better. There's a lot more traction there. And so I spent a lot of time working, you know, even things like ETS, the people who make who make um, standardized tests, um, the, the SATs, and working with them, obviously working with the military, working with, with big corporations, working with Gates Foundation, working with all these groups and trying to figure out this new pedagogy. How can we make this stuff simple and predictable and whatever? So I came out with a book called Short Sims about a year ago now, uh, which is which is great. I teach a class at Allen Academy um, around around short sims. Obviously, you're you're very familiar with with with, with that. Um, with that work. Um, and having said that, um, when Bach first, you know, was writing Baroque music, in his view of the world, you know, he, he really wanted to figure out what music can do and what couldn't do. And, 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 and so he just sort of was saying, like, how, how expressive can music be? And Johann Sebastian Bach built a terrific library of content that other composers like Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn ran with and said, oh, great, you know, Beethoven gave us, or not Beethoven, I'm sorry, Bach gave us the tools and now, you know, we can, we can really run with it. And so to some degree, I'm, I'm in, I'm in Bach mode. Uh, I'm in, you know, 
we have this new thing, this interactive content, I'm calling shorts and I don't care what you call them. Um, but we're learning about, you know, what is the role of coaches? What is the role of mistakes? What is the role of media? What is the role of, of the tone? What is the role? How can you have a collaborative tone in a, in a, in a fixed piece of media? How, so there's so many, it's really, really easy to create your first short sim. Uh, it's really easy to, um, you know, look at some of what I've done and go, yeah, okay, I, I get that. But the reality is, is that, you know, traditional linear content has 400 years on me. And so we need to come up with all the new rules. And so I'm going to be spending another 10 years doing everything I can to expand the, the, the spectrum uh, of, of pedagogy, of understanding of this incredibly new, incredibly powerful, incredibly exciting kind of technology. So, um, you know, everything I do every client I grab, uh, every new client I'm blessed to work with, uh, you know, challenges me in a new way of saying, well, you know, can you do this or can you do that? Or can we do boring paperwork and make it interesting, exciting? Yes, we can. Can we do fraud control? Yeah, you know, yes, we can. Can we teach people how to be Socratic teachers? Yes, we can. And, you know, every single thing, uh, you know, is, it increases not just, oh, here's another short sum I made, but increases the, the, the number of techniques that we have at, you know, the number of crayons in the crayon, crayon box. So uh, it's going to be, I'm going to be working on that and, every, and, you know, and playing computer games and being inspired by the, the mini map in the bottom right of the screen. So how can I use a mini map and be inspired by the, the, the whatever. So, um, and, and again, how do we use art and how do we use art in a, you know, in an elegant way? How do we have, and again, if you go to shortsims.com for such examples, you'll see a lot of, you know, examples where there's art involved and the art is, is to the degree it's on one hand, it's really easy to put together. They're, they're static images. On the other hand, they're put together in a way that make them feel interactive. You click on something and it moves a little bit. You click on something and you move, move a little bit. This is not fancy technology at all, but it's incredibly satisfying when you are making a lab, for example, or, you know, I have one on this, on, on, on there about, you know, why is diversity important? So here run an organization. I'm going to give you three decisions. Uh, and at the end of the three decisions, you're going to either be happy if you, if you, you know, in some situations are really unhappy in others, but you'll certainly gain a, a profound insight in only three decisions around diversity and inclusiveness and why it's so important. So, you know, we're, we're, we're just opening up this entirely new world that finally gets us away from this really terrible content we've all been stuck with. So it's, I, I think it's just, you know, that's going to be the next 10 years of my life. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so I hope that uh, everyone follows up and continues to pay attention and follows you online and see where you take this and because you're so freely sharing uh, so much of this. So my next question is about language and terminology. And I, I've set this up because there's a lot of language that's used in our profession and the learning and development profession or whatever you wanna call it. That itself is one of the labels and issues. But is there a performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And perhaps you want to put your spin on it because it's being misused or misconstrued or that you just want to promote uh, a particular uh, term or phrase. What would you have for us? Well, the two thoughts there, and one of them is going back to the evidence-based thing. I think evidence-based is, you know, three days away from being a toxic term and don't don't rest on that. Don't don't rely on that. Don't say, oh, good, it's evidence based. Frankly, there's no evidence that evidence based practices work. There's no evidence that evidence based practices sell better. There's no practice, you know. So so you know, be be you know, hold the term to the same standards that you're saying. You know that that you hold. I think the other meta theme is saying, you know, why is it that we have to keep inventing terms? Is it because we are getting better and we are changing and we are refining our craft? Not really, it's because no one likes what we do. Uh, and so we keep having to, oh, we don't, you know, we don't do training anymore, we do development or we do this. And, we, and you know, there's a reason why, you know, if indeed the the, the phrase or the, the word training leaves a dead pit in everyone's stomach, that's because people haven't liked it, haven't really said this is something we want to do more of or more than we have to do. And so at the very least, we, you know, use the fact, the meta theme that we're changing names all the time and coming up with new terms to describe basically the same old stuff. Um, and again, this notion of evidence-based practices implies that before there wasn't evidence-based practices, before we we're just making stuff up and, and now we're not kind of thing. And so not only do we come up with new terms all the time, but we also sort of abandon terms all the time. And I, you know, I, I, 
another way of looking at this too is is our industry is constantly drafting off of consumer technology and so you know tivos came out and suddenly oh training should be more like tivos and then suddenly you know mobile computers came out and oh they should be more like mobile computers and now you know virtual reality and ar oh virtual training it's like no stop it um you know we're an ai i mean you have no clue what ai is going to do in training but they're sure it's going to do something um and so you know almost you know, get off this merry-go-round of of these sort of terms. And you know, the one of the great profit centers in the in the industry are the are the training conferences, or at least you know there were before pre-pandemic and probably post-pandemic. Um, you know, and so these conferences are are based on the promise of hey, come and we'll you'll learn all about VR and AR. Um, and everyone goes and learns all about VR and AR, which is about seven examples that actually work. Um, and then they go home and they don't ever do it, and they go back to their old workbook model. And so. Um, you know, get off that merry-go-round, get off, you know, don't, don't get, don't get sucked up into this sort of, you know, day one, prop something up, day two, tear it down. Uh, and then, you know, rinse and rinse, lather and, and uh, lather and, and uh, rinse and repeat. It's, you know, it's, they're, they're, this is for a reason, which is at this point, you know, people are not happy with, 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 and by people, I mean, sponsors and users, that I care about. And one of the great ahas about short sims from my experience, and hopefully your experience will be the same, but though it may, may differ is sponsors like it because they're not too expensive and learners like it because they're fast and they're effective and they make sense. And they sort of align with their neural pathways of how they actually learn. And people like me are happy because I can make them fairly quickly. And when customers say, Hey, that's nice, but you made three things wrong with it. It's easy to change. Great. Let's change it. Oh, okay. Thanks Clark. If you fixed those big problems that I had with it, bang done. And so, you know, what happens when you have a model of which I'll put up short sims as one, but hopefully there's a lot of others as well. You know, we're, you know, there are models which just make everyone happy and say, like, okay, okay, good. You know, and, and it, it's drama free and i think we we get so caught up in the you know our space is so drama filled in terms of oh people don't like it or you know we gotta we have to justify it no it really is nutritious no it really is research-based or whatever and i you know i i think those are all symptoms that we haven't nailed down that we we don't have the right formula formula yet and by the way schools are going through the same problems yes thank you all right let me shift again uh, one more time here before we get to our wrap up but uh, I wanted to share with our audience people that uh, you, you've worked with or that you admire, uh, that you think are good examples for people to learn from. Uh, who are the people that you would name that uh, in the industry or outside of the learning and development industry um, th that provide examples to us and that we can all learn from? I think Will Wright is certainly the guy who came up with the Sims and SimCity, and and, uh, and I think he's I, he's one of the few people who have sort of made a lot of very successful computer game genres. And I think he he has a knowledge about rethinking content through an interactive lens that I think is probably second to none. Uh, so um, I had the pleasure of interviewing him for you know, for forty five minutes and. Uh, I'm not easily awed by someone's intelligence, but you know, I was just, I was just along for the ride. Um, you know, he, he left me in the dust so many times. It was, it was great. Um, so just, you know, just as someone who I suspect over time, the more we can study his own thinking process, I think that the better off we will all be. Um, so I think that would probably be the, 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 the best example uh, of, of someone whom I think is just really, really, absolutely genius level of thinking about the nature of interactivity, the nature of fun, the, na the nature of engagement um, that we, you know, we all need, need to, to think about. Well, thank you. Well, Clark, thanks so much for participating in this interview with me. My final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those new to the field related to all things performance improvement or education or training or learning? Yeah, I think if you like learning, this is the best industry in the world. I think this is one of the coolest industries uh, because you're learning all the time and every single new project, you're learning new stuff. And I just had a robbery sim, how to prevent a robbery in a bank. And so I could spend three weeks learning all about robberies. Then I had another one about um, so non-Euclidean geometry thing for, 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 um, for a university. And I could learn all about that. And then there's another 
one about you know um five you know 5g networks and for for you know for for the salespeople. And great i can learn all about that and so it's just it really is the most sensational industry in the world if you like learning if if you get up in the morning and you enjoy grabbing onto something um and then the simulation side of it is fun because you know now you're putting together content in, in new ways and you're actually not only creating content that people like but also you're you're pioneering, you're, you know, you're laying down the foundation for potentially a hundred years of, 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 of learning theory. And so you have the fun of, of learning every day You have the fun of, of, and, and also being visual. And again, I, I'm uh, I'm much more, you know, I love visual. I love interactivity. I love that notion of content. And again, you get to do that. So this is really just an, uh, an amazing, amazing industry for, for certainly people like me who, who like to think, who like to invent, who like to draw and scribble, who like to uh, research and learn about things. One more really fun thing about this industry that I think people don't appreciate is you get to talk to like best in the world people. And so when I was working with a credit card company, you know, I was talking to the person who understood fraud better than most people, if not all people in the world. When I was doing a one on cybersecurity, I get to talk to the person at Google and the person at Microsoft and the person at Intel who was their, you know, their top people on cybersecurity um, and or shipping and logistics or whatever. And so you know, it's just this incredible honor and privilege. You know, I'm always a stupid one to be sure, um, you know, uh, but I get to talk to just brilliant, brilliant world leading people at, you know, world leading organizations uh, on a regular basis uh, who are not the flashiest or the most arrogant or the, or the highest profile people, these people who just live and breathe the content. So it's just a spectacular industry. If you, if that kind of stuff really gets you motivated and not only learning about it, but doing something with it and being, you know, it's not the academic writing the term paper. It's not the, or, or the new article, it's really creating unique content that solves, that solves real problems. And so um, again, it's just, it is the coolest industry when you can kind of get, get away from all the barnacles. Yes. I, I, I so much agree with what you just said. Thank you so much. Well, again, thanks for sharing with us today and uh, look forward to uh, learning more from you uh, over the years as you continue to push uh, short SEMS. Thanks again. Thank you, guys.